This is an edited version of an interview I did about a year ago with Derek Lambert of Myth Vision Podcast's YouTube channel that's quite popular out there. And I wanted to present it to you, my YouTube viewers, and preface it here with some of the things that I have been thinking about in relationship to it more recently. It's based a lot on this book that I published in 2012, Paul and Jesus. And there's a chapter in this book on the Battle of the Apostles, which where I argue that there is actually a real break between Paul and the other apostles, the 12, as he calls them, and James, the brother of Jesus. And a lot of people get confused with James the fisherman or the other James that's mentioned in the 12, and it becomes very confusing. I also have a chapter called Christianity Before Paul, and that also has to do with what were things like for the 20 years from the crucifixion of Jesus, which I would date to about 30, the year 30, to the 50s when we get Paul's letters. Uh, some scholars have called that the dark ages of early Christianity, that period that's largely lost to us before we begin to hear from Paul. And when we do begin to hear from Paul, he's already spent several decades developing some of his ideas. But in his letters, he sometimes reflects back on eyewitness accounts and encounters that he had with the apostles. And that's what I cover in the interview. This is part of a trilogy of books. Uh, I'll put them in order here. They kind of go together. If I can hold all three of them up without dropping them, um, I'll do them one by one. The Jesus Dynasty, which is the first book of the trilogy, and then Paul and Jesus, and after that, the uh, Jesus Discovery. So this is actually my take on the historical Jesus. Paul and Jesus is what I'm going to talk about in this interview primarily. Lots more to say in uh, subsequent programs. And then this is the archaeology of the whole Jesus movement, including the Talpio tombs and all sorts of other things about the Jesus movement. If you read those three together you will get a good overview of the kind of work that I've been doing for the past 30 years that combines texts, archaeology, critical reading of source materials, inscriptions, and so forth to try to say what can we really know about the Jesus movement. I like to call it the John the Baptist, Jesus, James movement, with Paul coming along later. I also have this uh, book, which is a version of my dissertation published years ago in the 1980s, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. This puts Paul into the context of Hellenistic religions. It's a broad look. It was directed by my professor at the University of Chicago, Jonathan Z. Smith, who was one of the brightest of uh, historians of religion. And it builds upon Paul's mystical experience. So all of these go together in presenting uh, at least my conclusions at this point. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the interview and learn a lot. Do you think Galatians is clearly talking about Peter and James in a negative light? Whether he is personally antagonistic towards them or not, like when he visited them, did he dread going and hate seeing them or anything of that sort? I don't think so. But where he's adamant, and you have to look at the context of Galatians, is where did he get his gospel? That's absolutely key to understanding Paul. Paul never met Jesus. He tells you, oh, I met James once by the time he writes the letters. The, that letter, Galatians, what, 50s, 49, 50, let's just say 50, year 50 CE, AD. Um, so he has met James. He said, I stayed with Peter for two weeks. So he probably got to know him pretty well. Uh, you know, just staying with somebody and talking all the time. I'm sure he wanted to hear a lot. So I want to think that they were friendly and Paul was probably very curious. 
But in terms of the message, look what he says in the very first chapter. And remember, the context is he's worried that some are drifting away from what he calls my gospel. He uses that term. I explain that in the book. It's a very definite term. My gospel. Why did he say our gospel or the gospel? Sometimes he says the gospel. But my gospel? And he says, I did not learn it from anybody. I didn't receive it from anybody. I got it as a revelation of or from Jesus Christ. I say of or from because the genitive there can either be, you know, through the agency of Jesus or directly from Jesus. I even like from because you get the idea. He says later in, in other letters, I received this from the Lord. So I'm going to go with from. So he got it from Jesus. So is it a revelation about Jesus? Yes, of course. But it's a revelation about Jesus from Jesus, meaning Jesus revealed himself to Paul. Mm. So that's important to him. And he, the whole point of that chapter is to establish his independence. If, if readers haven't, you know, your, your I say viewers, readers, whatever, if they haven't read it lately, you should read chapter 1 and 2 of Galatians, two of the most important and revealing chapters in the New Testament. I think they're unquestionably authentic. They're kind of the key to the whole historical Jesus debate because you've got a guy in the 50s who's testifying kind of in the first person about his experiences of, you know, receiving the revelation from Jesus, and he calls it a revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's that's big. Now, but the tone all the way through is, yes, I did go up to Jerusalem to those who were in Christ before me. And he said, I went up by revelation. What does that mean? He was out, There's a conference. We call it the First Jerusalem Conference. It's recorded in the book of Acts, Acts 15. There it's very, very kumbaya. Very friendly. Everybody hugs and kisses and no disagreement. Paul does say they reached an agreement. Unfortunately, we don't have the minutes of that meeting. We've got Luke's account many, many decades later. And I think, you know, we get glimpses in, in Paul's letter of what went on. But what's really interesting is the language that he is. Mm. He said, I went up by revelation. What does that mean? That means Jesus said, you can go. You know, you're my guy. You can go. And I took Titus with me as my show and tell, I call it. Now, I don't know. They're not going to drop his pants and show he's yeah. uncircumcised. But the idea is, here is a Gentile. He couldn't do Timothy, because remember, Timothy was Jewish. But he's got a Gentile, Titus, who is clean, morally, spiritually, sexually. He believes in the one God. He doesn't worship idol. He, he's like... This is what my gospel is producing. Come with me, Titus. You're my helper. You're my friend. I'm sure he loved him very much. So he said, I took Titus. I went up by revelation. And then he said, and we met and we talked. And then two times he says, and to the, those who were reputed to be pillars. Mm. Notice the language. The Greek is interesting. But you can also translate it. I think the RSV or one of them does this. I like it. And the so-called pillars of yeah. the church. I love that. <laughs> the so-called pillars. What they are means nothing to me. Now, he doesn't mean, they don't mean anything to me like I trash them, I hate them. He, that's not what he's saying. He's saying in terms of two issues, two issues here. Is Titus okay? That's what the issue is. Is my guy okay in the eyes of the authorities at Jerusalem? That would be James and all the other apostles, now including Matthias who replaced Judas. So that's, and the rest of the Jerusalem church, which is the headquarters church. This is the Vatican. You know, this is going to the headquarters in that day. And you're getting the approval of, quote, the Pope, the Papa, the, the head of everything. Jesus, brother, James, we'll talk a lot about that. Yeah. So anyway, what does he say? He says, uh, I went up. The two issues are, is he okay? And here's what I'm preaching. Are you guys okay with this? Because I want to know, am I running in vain? He loves, he loves runner images. He uses them quite often. He's, 
he's he's a Hellenistic Jew. He grew up in the diaspora. He's yeah. probably seen you know sports are big. Like it would be a baseball image. He does today. it in Philippians when he talks about the yeah. reed, getting that yeah that winners. It'd be reed. like if you said to me something to me about baseball or football or basketball in America. You know, I'd be like, hey, Paul. You know, you. So he says, I I could be running in vain in this race. You know, so that's why he's going. He wants to know. And I laid before them my gospel. He says, I laid it before them. But notice he's saying, but what if they had disagreed? Guess what? I'm going to listen to Jesus, guys. And I know you were with them a long time ago. But, you know, you need to get updated. Because I'm, I heard from Jesus. And he gives the chronology, you know, 14 years ago and then three years ago. And we don't know if it's 14 plus 3, 17. Or does he mean 14 uh, three and then 14 all together, but either way it gets you right around 50, you know, 49, 50 right in there. But then two times he says, you know, not only what, what they are means nothing to me, but like they added nothing. You know, now that can mean that they agreed and, and it's possible that they did agree. I think they did. Acts 15 is, I would say, accurate in this sense mm -hmm. that, uh, James said, no, the, gent the non-Jews, I like to say non-Jews, Gentiles, kind of the old, it's actually a Latin word that means nation. So. Right. And you know that Israel's called Gentile when Abraham's going to become a great nation, mm -hmm. going to become a great Gentile. So Gentile is not a good word. The non-Jews, the non-Israelites. Uh, I think the decision was generally agreed. It's rabbinic, really, that non-Jews have a place in the world to come if they follow the basic, what are called the Noahite laws, the basic laws that are applicable to all humanity, but Jews are under a special covenant, the Sinai covenant, the Horeb covenant, and they obviously are obligated to follow the whole Torah. Now, whether James added also an oral Torah like the Pharisees and the Sadducees had done with all their interpretations, you gotta interpret something, like how do you keep the Sabbath, you know, what is this, what is that? Uh, but Paul, Paul, the, the laws that they generally list in the book of Acts are like things like sexual morality. It's, called, it's translated fornication. But it just means you've got to live a sexually moral life. You can't eat blood, which is a little odd, but that's associated with idolatry. Because the meat in an ancient city like Corinth, the, the makelon, the meat market, that meat has all been dedicated to Athena. So a lot of Jews would, I'm not going to, buy that meat that was dedicated to a pagan god. We, I'm going to have my own kosher and my own way of getting meat and so forth. So the, but basically it's, it's just like clear ethics that would apply to all decent people. You know, the rabbis would say like, don't murder, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, live a sexually moral life, and turn from idols to God, the one God. So here's Titus. He's doing all that. He's cleaned up, or maybe he was never that you know, pagan, I don't know. But the point is, he's a good example. And Paul says, this is okay. But what if they had said, and this gets to your question, um, no, Paul, actually, they should start moving toward the Torah. Hey, six months a year, we'd like to see them convert to Judaism, take on the whole Torah. He would have walked out of the meeting. There's no question. Now, they probably didn't say that, but there are gr there are pockets and groups within the Jesus movement that are thinking that would be the way, like if God has given all of these commandments for our good, dietary laws and all sorts, the festivals, they're beautiful festivals that Judaism treasures today. Mm -hmm. Don't you want these Gentiles that have been worshiping Isis and Athena and you know Zeus and so forth, they need a culture. They, they should kind of move toward, you know, Jewish culture. And finally, maybe the males can become circumcised. We can mikvah them, you know, dip them. They can become Jews. Now, if they had said that, I think Paul. So I'm trusting Paul. I think he's our... I'm, I'm saying that Acts is probably accurate on the main parameters because Paul said we agreed. And certainly Paul is agreeing. Right. Now, here's the stickler. Here's the stickler. <laughs> and it's tough. And I take a position in the book. Okay, is Acts 15 is giving you the ideal. Jews stay Jews, and they believe in Jesus Christ, and they're sanctified by the Holy Spirit and forgiven of their sins. 
Gentiles keep the basic, let's just call it the basic morality for all human beings from the time of Noah, you know, before Sinai. Obviously, you can't lie, cheat, steal back then either. It was, you know, God is a God of justice and righteousness throughout history. So uh, uh, the question then is, if a Jew really, that Paul works with, because he converted Jews too, and the Jew begins to talk to Paul maybe privately and says, you know, this Torah thing um, that the rabbis are teaching at the synagogue, do we need to follow all of those interpretations, Paul? And I'm picturing Paul saying, well, you know, a lot of the interpretations, the traditions, I've been told by James and Peter, what we call halakha, uh, how to walk in the Torah, oral tradition, the rabbis call it today. The Pharisees had it uh, developed. A lot of that, you know, that's maybe some of that is good, but it really gets down in a lot of minutia. Like if I'm a tailor, the Mishnah discusses, can I carry a pen, a needle? in my lapel because it's carrying a burden and that is the tool of my work. A needle is the tool of my work. You say, well, what's a needle? It's light. That isn't how it works. Are you carrying the tool of your work? Well, then the plumber can carry his tools and the doctor can carry his tools and the construction worker, you see the idea. Mm -hmm. And I kind of picture Paul uh, being, and maybe James, I think James and Peter as well, being pretty, we, Back then it would be considered, uh, the word liberal and conservative is misused even today, but to have a freer, more open interpretation of how to keep the commands. Like, I'm going to keep the Sabbath, for example, but how do I keep the Sabbath? And I don't know this because Paul never comments on it, but he does say once in Colossians, which is probably a secondary Pauline letter, but he says things like, and in Galatians, in Galatians too, I can quote that, in Colossians, bring, he says, you observe days, seasons, months, years, touch not, taste not, handle not. That's not what it's about. So some of his people are getting pulled toward more that, you know, fully observe it, maybe in following the Pharisaic interpretation, maybe the Sadducean interpretation, maybe the Qumran interpretation, which is the Dead Sea Scroll more Sadducean, but even more strict than the Pharisees. I want your listeners to know that the Pharisees are the liberals. Everybody thinks they're conservative. Mm. They're actually the liberals. Because they try to figure out how to make ways for people to practically live according to Torah. For example, the Torah says you can't go out of your house on the Sabbath. And it says to put the toilets outside the house. Whoa, what are we going to do there? No problem with the uh, Pharisees, they mark what's called an eruv around the area. They still that, do it today in Jerusalem. And you can have a toilet, you know, way out or whatever. You don't have, house is defined. Now my house is like my town. That's my house. Whereas at Qumran, they apparently, Josephus says, go, no, nah, you got to hold it 24 hours. You stay in the camp. Toilets are outside the camp. And Josephus says, and I admire them so for their great piety. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I did work at Qumran and found the latrines. I published this wow. in, the, in the Revue de Qumran, the journal. People can look it up. It's also on my website, all my articles, uh, jamestabor.com, if you look. Anyway, Josias and I found the latrines, and they're 200 cubits northwest of the camp that they were actually using. Mm. And as Joe said, can you imagine at sundown when the bell rung, so to speak, whew, people are heading Lining up, up. <laughs> heading up the hill. So anyway, so, the, so I, I mention the, all that just to say that, yeah. you know, an example of some of the, and I'm not making fun of Judaism uh, for orthodoxy and strict. Right. Uh, I've been in orthodox homes for the Sabbath. It's a pleasure. It's a delight, believe me. Some way, like you're not answering the phone, you're not doing this and that. That's also a good thing. You know, and there's, right. you don't have to worry about anything. You just, for 24 hours, have talk and eat and drink wine and associate, you know. So, right. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, no, what, yeah. what, I guess getting to the heart of the problem, Paul, Peter, and James, um, I've heard people say, even I think Dr. Pagels thinks that, um, you know, there's definitely a problem between the groups because soon after that, 
Paul is now confronting Peter. It's yeah. it, it, this it's isn't a, you know they're not just best pals and buds in this whole thing. Now oh I confronted him to his face to his face. What's Paul trying to say to his Galatian audience? Because he's trying to tell them something, and then he's constantly defending himself from this day forward. It seems yeah. I am not a liar. I did not lie. What's the accusation? It, it, there's so many problems yeah. that Paul's trying to address, it and is. it makes me think that they fractioned. At first, we were cool. They even approved of it. Yeah. Why are you saying that about they approved of I it? I think was yeah. probably, I'll come back to Peter, but, but there's a wider, Peter was a, a table fellowship thing, and we, we know what that was about. Right. I'll get back to that, but there's a wider issue, and it's, it's absolutely the major issue. And it's actually known in Acts, in Acts 21, years later when Paul goes finally to Jerusalem again, and he's coming up with gifts. He ends up getting arrested and so forth, and it's the end of the story. But before that happens, what does he do when he, as soon as he arrives? And he's brought gifts from the Gentiles. This is fulfilling the prophets for him. Right. We'll talk about that later. He thinks these are the prophesied that the the non-Jews will bring gifts up to Jerusalem in the last days. So, you know, it's it, it's almost like symbolic. I don't know how much he brought, but maybe, you know, maybe he had several thousand people donating, and then he goes, we brought this for the Jewish people to help the poor and so forth. So he goes in to see James, and James says, oh, Paul, I'm paraphrasing. He says, uh, so great to see you. Uh, there is something, though, before we go further, we need to clarify some people are saying that you are going beyond our agreement, the Galatians agreement. Like, we agreed that Gentiles don't have to keep the Torah halakhically, like, like Jews. We agreed on that, so we're there. And uh, so that's not the issue. But there are rumors that you're telling some Jews, maybe you yourself, that even Jews really don't need to keep the Torah in the full strict way of an observant Jew because we're so near the end of time that the, what, what he says in uh, Corinthians, the form of this world is passing away. Meaning we're moving into a time when there's neither Jew nor Greek and he even says it in Galatians. Mm -hmm. There's neither slave or free, there's neither male or female. He thinks there's going to be this cosmic transformation. Now, James doesn't say all that, but, he's, but notice, in Acts, he doesn't let Paul answer, which is not a witness to what actually happened. It's a witness to the author of Acts, writing chapter 21, wanting you to know that Paul's still Torah observant, whether he is or not, and is taking the side of James. Right the side that Jews need to keep the Torah. That's consistent all the way through the book of Acts. But he does, Paul doesn't answer. So what he says, I always laugh when I hear it, he says, so that they will know these rumors, so that everyone will know that these rumors aren't true. Like he just said, be like I say to you, Derek, I heard you were doing this, 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 but I know you're not. And in order to show that you're not, could we do, you go, well, wait, uh, actually, are you sure? let's have a little discussion of this. Now, Thank God we have 1 Corinthians 9. This is earlier where he's writing, later than Galatians, but earlier than the meeting at the, toward the end in the 50s. And he says, you know, here's my strategy. To the Jew I become as a Jew. Wait a minute. You become as a Jew? Well, what does that mean? Uh, and to those under the law I become as one under the law. What do you mean, as one under the law? Jews are under the law. You know, under, and by the way, it doesn't mean under the burden or oppression of the law. It means it's the bar mitzvah. You take on the yoke of the law, but Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Meaning my interpretations of the Torah have to do with what God really wants. Like, how do you keep the Sabbath? It's supposed to be a blessing. It's made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So don't take it as... Under the law, meaning like, oh, I'm under this law, it's so horrible, because that's the later Protestant view, and it's still the view of Judaism today by many Christians. They, oh, those poor Jews, they have to do all this stuff if they only knew Christ. Non-issue. That is not the issue. Paul makes that clear. But he says, and then he says, not under the Torah to God or Christ, you know, 
meaning he says, as if I'm under the Torah, although I'm really not in terms of Christ, because I'm under the Torah of Christ. Mm. And then he goes, and to the Gentiles I become as a Gentile. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean as a Gentile? I think he would, it, it's usually things like table fellowship. Like I'm invited over and you have a meal. I don't start inquiring, um, where, where did you, uh, I see you have some, uh, you know, what, chicken there or something, where, where, where did, or lamb, let's go with lamb. Where was that? Did you, did you purchase that at the local Isis temple this morning? You know? Yeah. So you become, you don't, and he says in Romans 14, eat what is put before you, don't ask questions, you know, don't, you know, just, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. This is all in Corinthians. Now, clearly, James and Peter, Peter, I don't, we don't know enough about Peter, but James, in what he represents. Torah observant, messianic Judaism with Jesus as the Messiah, raised from the dead, returning again. Uh, he would not agree with that. Ju you know, I think Acts is reflecting uh, probably where James would be on that issue. So Jews need to, Jews are to observe the Torah in an enlightened way according to the teachings of Jesus that we have some inkling of. But Gentiles uh, don't, they're not ob obligated to keep all those things. It mainly has to do with dietary laws, circumcision, festivals, the Sabbath. Especially. Paula Fredrickson's kind of, she's hit the nail on the yeah, head in, in exactly. a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, did he break with them or is he against them? My sense is that he believes things that if they knew he believed them, there would be an absolute break. The question is, did that time ever come? Now, and I'll finish the question with this, because I know you have other related things. Yeah, but, we got four minutes left till okay, time's good. out. So, in my book, Paul and Jesus, and I, str I struggle with this more than anything, called Battle of the Apostles, and I cover all this, but I finally say, did they keep this uneasy kind of coexistence where Paul doesn't really let on what he's really saying and doing? Because he's out in the hinterland. And then when he goes up to James, he's like, oh, yeah, we agreed. Yeah, Jews need to keep the Torah. Here, give me some of your kosher meat. That's really good. You know, did he kind of play along? Because he says, I be, yeah, I act like a Jew. I'm under the law. Although I'm really not under law, he says. He is under the law of Christ, whatever that means. Uh, and we can talk about that on his ethics. So anyway, here's the question. Did he get exposed at some point? by people visiting Corinth primarily. Because in 2 Corinthians, which is not a single letter, it's probably as many as four letters, it's all fragmented. But I did my PhD dissertation on 10 through 12. That's actually 10 through 13, include 13. And I focus particularly on Paul's ascent to paradise. But the question is, he starts talking about, are they Hebrews, so am I? Are they Israelites, so am I? Are they apostles? So am I. I'm a better one, and so forth. And people go, well, he's not talking about the Jerusalem people. No way. That's, you know, that's, it's other apostles and Jews and leaders. That's the standard opinion. I'm sure 99% of my colleagues hold that view. But I went back to F.C. Bauer. This is 1800s. F.C. Bauer taught a lot of the great, uh, a lot of the greats uh, of, of the Enlightenment in the German, you know, movement of New Testament studies. This is Ferdinand Christian Bauer. And he argued that there was an absolute split in dichotomy. A lot of people will say things like, can you believe that Tabor went back to Bauer? He's been totally discredited. This is B-A-U-R, not E-R. Because there's an E-R that's known for his New Testament dictionary. Um, Walter Bauer. So F.C. Bauer. And uh, I just say to that, yeah, I did go back to Bauer, and I got convinced he was right. I think Paul broke with the apostles, and I'm sure it was on this issue. And yet, I don't think he was really against the Torah. He just thought it was passing away. I don't think he wrote Hebrews, but there's a line in Hebrews that I think he would sign on to. The opening What is obsolete is, passing. Is, is, is presently passing away. The form of this cosmos is passing away. And he says, the time will come 
that those who have wives will be as those that have none and so forth. He believes the parousia, the coming of Jesus and the transformation is so near that this touch not, taste not, handle not. And there's a sense in which uh, this would resonate, I think, with many people. I mean, on some levels, it certainly resonates with me. I want to be, I want to be the objective scholar that's trying to descriptively figure out what happened and not take a side like, well, that was really good what he said or bad. <laughs> Obviously, the parousia didn't come. But, you know, his idea was all of that will be completely moot very soon. We won't even be talking about it. And I want to explore that further, some of the ramifications of that parousia not arriving. But that's a big one. I definitely want to as well. Thank you so much.